Welcome everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining us tonight for this um, NBS Edu World MOOC rerun webinar on methods to introducing NBS, nature-based solutions, and sustainability in the classroom. So this project, um, this webinar is proposed by the project and organized by the NBS Edu World Project, an EU-funded project that seeks to nurture relationships to put NBS on the agenda of everyone and in education. Uh, the MOOC itself uh, is supported by trained technologies and scientists who are offering this webinar tonight. Now, letting you know a few housekeeping rules before we get started and introduce our speakers. Uh, the event is recorded and will be made available online. Um, so everybody is being recorded right now, but your cameras and your microphones are off. So there's uh, no problem there. That also means though that for question and answers for our speakers, uh, we ask that you post your questions in the chat. And uh, at the end of the webinar, we will be relaying those questions for you on your behalf. Now, let me introduce our speakers. We have a great lineup today. So we are going to look at nature-based solutions and ways to introduce NBS and sustainability into education through very different lenses tonight. So we have uh, Iselin Mulvik, she works for PPMI, the Public Policy Management Institute, uh, and focuses on research and policy analysis. We have Priscilla Franco Steyer uh, working for ECLE, Local Governments for Sustainability, who's going to tell us a little bit more about community engagement and NBS. Lucas Katikas and Talia Saknia from Eleno, Eleno Germaniki Agogi is a private and educational facility and will share some insights on open schooling. And finally, Dominique Silva from Train Technologies. Uh, Train Technologies is a heating and cooling systems company and they have a strong focus on sustainability. And they'll, she will tell us a little bit more uh, about sustainability and STEM education uh, and how the two combine. But before we get to the great presentations, uh, a little bit of a housekeeping rule as promised. So uh, for the webinar, please share your questions in the chat uh, and we will relay them. Another very important thing, the signatures list. The signatures list is a mandatory tool for us. So please take a moment to fill in the signatures list. So it is necessary for you to get a certificate of participation for the event. No signature, no certificates. So take a second. My colleague will share the link through the chat and you can see it on the slide as well. Uh, please click on it and uh, fill it in. You can fill it in at any time during the uh, webinar. We will remind you of it at some point, but it is very important. We will also follow up with you uh, with a questionnaire and a feedback form through this uh, list. But now is the time to get our speakers in the spotlight. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. So we will start with Iselin. Uh, you can now take control. Uh, we will now spotlight you for everyone to see you. And uh, you can tell us a little bit more about your perspective of nature-based solutions. Yeah, so thank you so much for inviting me and for um, also for the introduction. And um, so let me see if I can already go to my first slide. Um, yes, um, but I wanted to just quickly um, uh, give a bit of a background context from my presentation. Um, so as was mentioned, uh, I work as a policy researcher and consultant uh, for PPMI, a consultancy group based in Lithuania, and we were, were working a lot on research in relation to uh, the green transition in education, sustainability, education, etc. And we have been working on a very interesting project together with the European Schoolnet, uh, which was a, a pilot study back in 2019 on how trying to understand how nature-based solutions can be included in education and also trying to um, to pilot different learning scenarios together with teachers. 
Um, and as a part of this uh, project, um, PPMI did the kind of um, desk research and interviews and tried to analyze al also based on what is available of information, what is the state of play in Europe. So looking at, um, at different strategies, at a curriculum, looking at different initiatives uh, that are taking place already and what are the kind of challenges and barriers to teaching nature-based solutions. Uh, so this presentation will be just a kind of a quick uh, summary of some of the main findings uh, from this uh, study, uh, but also uh, because we're kind of still continuing to work in this in this field, I'll also try to bring some um, more new or like recent reflections. Um, but before I start, I also wanted to quickly go through the definition that we're using for nature-based solutions. So I'm aware that um, you may not may all not know the term nature-based solutions. Um, so uh, nature-based solutions um, is a is a specific kind of technical terms, it sounds, but it's also one that we should be uh, familiar with because it is something that we are all familiar with, which is nature. But nature-based solutions are innovations inspired and supported by nature, um, which are cost-effective, simultaneously provide environmental, social, and economic benefits, and help build resilience. Um, they should bring uh, more and more diverse nature and natural features and processes into cities, landscapes, and seascapes through locally adapted, resource-efficient, and systemic interventions. So they're natural inter inter interventions with very strong environmental, social, and economic aspects up to them. And uh, nature-based solutions must also benefit biodiversity and support the delivery of a range of ecosystem services. Uh, so these are kind of the some of the key elements of what nature-based solutions is about. So yeah, if we go to the state of play in Europe today, um, some of the kind of findings that we saw from our research was that nature-based solution um, in the last um, five, ten years have become uh, more of a, a, a um, common term and topic to be uh, discussed and reflected in general policy documents, so in strategic documents, for example, in, in um, environmental policy, in biodiversity policy, uh, but we could not find a very specific integration of this term in education policy documents. And this means that um, the kind of uh, this uh, specific perspective of education um, uh, is not integrated into the policy agenda of MBS. And this is based on our um, desk research of different member states in the European Union. Um, Furthermore, nature-based solutions was not explicitly mentioned in the curricula. We focused on seven EU countries and also the European schools. Um, and that nature-based solutions was also not in mentioned in the school plans, textbooks on training materials that we uh, studied during the study. Uh, but this was also back in 2019. But one thing that we do see, and which I think has become even more apparent the last year since 2019, is that there are many good examples of nature-based solutions being integrated in non-formal education, also in informal education and in higher education as well. Um, although there are less examples or kind of concrete examples in formal education. Um, so um, these kind of uh, initiatives for like uh, formal school settings um, is kind of underexploited and this was kind of also the aim of this previous project and what EUN has been working on to to kind of try to fill this gap. Um, but also there are some uh, pedagogical mediums that were uh, specifically well suited to teaching nature based solutions that we also saw in the study, such as problem based and place based learning. And also recently to kind of contextualize more since after the study, um, there has also been increasing uh, focus in the curricula and in learning materials on education for sustainable development and climate change education, which also is a good context, which um, allows more linkages for nature-based solutions and opportunities for nature-based solutions also to be taught and linked to the curricula, even if it's not explicitly mentioned. Um, and also one really important kind of resource for teachers, but also for the wider community of people interested in education and also nature-based solution 
is all these the plethora of resources that have become available um, on HPA solutions um, run by different EU projects and more like technical and innovations and projects that has um, uh, re resulted in a lot of good resources for the evidence base on HPA solutions and the importance of nature based solutions. Um, and just I wanted to go quickly through some of the lessons from our learning scenarios with EUN, um, which is that actually these um, learning scenarios um, that were included in the in the in the pilot study saw that there are very interesting ways that nature based solution can be included in formal education uh, at dif in different connecting to different um, subjects and different school levels which really adds kind of value to this practices of teaching nature-based solutions um, and also kind of linking to the cross-disciplinary uh, approach and uh, focusing on complex and broad societal and environmental changes. Um, and also the learning scenarios were a good um, opportunity to explicitly teach nature-based solutions and the values and ex successful examples linking to key competences uh, and uh, collaboration, peer learning and feedback were integral to the process. So also different competences such as critical thinking, co com collaboration and creativity were some of the outcomes of um, the learning scenarios. But we also learned that um, uh, teachers do also need support and financial guidance, time and trust were some of the kind of keywords, the kind of support that teachers need in order to be feel more supported and more ready to teach nature-based solution and inter integrate it into their lessons. Uh, but one of the kind of, um, I know this script here is very small, but one of the kind of interesting quotes that we had from participants is that, for example, one teacher said that um, uh, the teacher thinks that the curriculum is as flexible as the teacher is, and that is um, that if this project can offer some resources on HB solutions and, activi and activities, then the teachers who are interested can take up these resources and use them immediately. So this is absolutely one of the key outcomes and important outcomes of this study by this project. So I just wanted to highlight quickly what are the kind of what's the importance of teaching nature based solutions and why are we doing this before we move on? So if we really want to um, affect the Earth's uh, climate and ecosystems in a fundamental way, which is needed considering the severe challenges um, the Earth is currently and our uh, populations are currently facing, we need change at the scale that is able to affect these macro processes, so to say. A nature-based solution is a brilliant device and approach that can help in this regard. So there is a need for fundamental change in the awareness, knowledge, skills, values and behaviors of our populations. Education is a particularly powerful means to raise awareness, but also to teach skills and to change behaviors. And it's a great way to bridge this all this innovation that has happened at the European uh, Union level, at innovation level, at a technology level over the last years, um, and also translate, translate this knowledge into uh, into different sectors. Um, so um, the learning scenarios really strengthen teachers and students uh, key competences that are also kind of transversal skills. And uh, another kind of element here is that quality of education, strengthening transversal skills such as collaboration, critical, critical thinking, etc., is also crucial in order to solve some of these um, uh, larger systemic issues and challenges that we are facing um, and nature-based solutions education education also gives very good opportunities for teaching transversal skills and also sustainability competences so teachers reported that learning scenarios help students feel more engaged about their surroundings um, and become creative problem solvers it re the study reaffirms that education plays an essential role in promoting environmental sustainability uh, values and behaviors more broadly. Um, so that I think is already a really good um, justification for why we need nature-based solutions education. Um, and I hope that my colleagues will build upon that. 
Thank you very much, Iselin, uh, and thank you for highlighting how important and how much sustainability education can achieve uh, for students and for the teachers, of course. Uh, everybody benefits from it. Now, let's move to our next speaker uh, and let's have a second uh, angle on uh, NBS education and sustainability. Priscilla, welcome. Thank you for being here tonight. You're muted. <laughs> yeah, thanks everyone. Thanks, Eddie. And I would like also to thank the UN for the opportunity to represent ECLEI Europe uh, NBS group, NBS and, uh, and biodiversity group. Um, yeah, so let me see here. Okay, yeah. As Evelyn already introduced you to the NBS concept. I won't be sticking on it for now. I would just like to acknowledge that we have the European Commission concept that we have been working with, and we also have uh, two other relevant concepts that we have that have some slight differences, and to acknowledge that we have one that is kind of uh, globally agreed, that is the UNEA concept from agreed on last year, 2022. So in this context of, of education, we have uh, in, in the context of, the, of Europe, in post-industry Europe, NBS is being considered as an outstanding opportunity to boost green jobs and nature positive economy. However, for this to be possible, the different formal education levels need to also be prepared to deliver new competences and skills to the next generations and prof as well the professionals in the market need that. So just wanted to complement <laughs> with this um, topic. So as also Iselin already mentioned, NBS addressed multiple societal challenges. However, biodiversity is uh, on its core. So when we want to distinguish whether some activity initiative policy is a NBS or not, we first need to inquire, inquire us, ourselves how far this is um, halting biodiversity loss. This is a key feature. So you see in the slide the 12 societal challenges that are that the European Commission consider also that NBS is addressing. And on the next slides, we will see four of them uh, which community building would mainly address. So we have here urban regeneration, health and well-being, participatory planning and governance, as social justice and social cohesion. So mm -hmm, here, yeah, so why community matters for us. So you can see here this this diagram could be a community sitting together on a table, planning some, some collective action or just having a nice picnic together. However, this is the COVID that made us all isolated and apart. So from this experience we all had, we can really, uh, we have a, a, already a very strong feeling um, why community matters. Uh, so you can see here on this slide, that at the end of the day, the community addresses directly our shared human needs, basic human needs. So you see here on the right figure that they have many le different levels of human needs and community can tackle those by uh, developing on us a strong sense of belonging, a sense of safety and com on mutual support, and for sure inspiration that is fundamental for our well-being and mental health. A strong care of each other and the commons that also um, gives us a sense of of purpose in life. And in in the topic that we are discussing, also community or working together, a community building can build us um, can lead to empowerment and education for citizen participation in the public agenda to then uh, deliver or that we can collectively work towards the changes that our world needs so so much, and Iselina already mentioned. Um, I forgot to to note my time here, so I don't know if I'm going to fast or to. Yeah. So how can NBS facilitate community building then? So NBS are about green public spaces, parks, protect areas, community gardens. And this creates spaces for interactions 
um, as public space, especially it should be inclusive spaces. And so those spaces can provide leisure, can promote opportunities for collective engagements in activities in benefit of the whole community. And also for, foster a sense of interdependence and share stewardship that we all have the capacity to, to implement, to, to keep on doing things together and see the results of our own actions and uh, as a collective. Uh, and when we engage in community to implement NBS, uh, this provide us informal and non-formal education opportunities, such acquiring uh, that we can uh, where we can acquire new skills, knowledges, and competences. And especially community-led nature-based solution, they act as laboratories for participatory decision making and collective action, which is very important. Um, yeah, so ICLE normally uh, works in, with a very well-established methodology for um, for NBS implementation that we call co-design and co-creation, and especially this can also be, we, we work with that for local governments, but this can definitely support also community building and community-led nature-based solutions. And through co-design and co-creation, again, we foster connection, trust, which is very important, interaction, mutual learning, and shared values. Uh, so here, the next slide, you can see our co-design principles to be open, inclusive, and di diverse, to be experimental and reflective, share goals and visions, be flexible, be transparent, think long-term. And you can see this also pretty much reflected on the green competences framework that we you might hear later on during the MOOC and also in, uh, in the whole school approach that we, we might also hear later. So basically, ICLE uses this co-design principles to, let me see here the next slide, to walk local governments and local actors through as the spectrum of public participation where we want to reach a, a stronger collaborative environment and more empowerment of local actors, where then local governments will be mo mainly enabler enablers of initiatives and policies and not only leading them. So it moves beyond consulting to a more active role of community and local actors. So the next slide, I will just not talk now. So here we have a beautiful word cloud for us to get inspired a bit with. Yeah. Oh, sorry. So basically the question then that that I leave to our next presenters would be how such a co-creation approach that is already well established in the NBS practice can be adopted or replicated by schools as catalyzers for community building. Um, yeah, so we we were thinking how how to implement co-creation and co-design also in schools. What when then when they are experimenting with NBS initiatives. So yeah, the main message would be yes, we can do it together. Thank you. <laughs> I hope you got inspired. Thank you very much, Priscilla. Um, thank you very much for uh, highlighting how much togetherness and how much collective work goes into nature-based solutions. It's at the level of community uh, or for all the experts and professionals who make NBS and all the communities that make NBS a reality. And it's in school as well. It's for the students that work together uh, towards creating solutions at their own, uh, in their own environment, in their own level. Uh, and this collaboration takes them to the outside world. It takes nature-based solutions in the class from inside the classroom to outside the classroom, which is what our next speakers are going to talk to us about. Uh, open schooling and how do you explore nature-based solutions beyond the classroom or how do you take the classroom outside really? Lucas, Talia, thank you very much for being with us tonight. Uh, the floor is yours. So, Thank you.
Eddie, uh, for the invitation to the webinar, to the webinar, and for being part um, of this effort, uh, of course. A brief introduction, uh, Falia and myself, um, we both work to Elena Germanikia Agogi, to the Research and Development Department of Elena Germanikia Agogi, a private school located here uh, in Athens, and mostly is focusing to educational uh, research. So in today's presentation, we're going to discuss and demonstrate um, some methods to introducing nature-based solutions and sustainability uh, in education. So we will first discuss um, about the role of education in the 21st century challenges and actually what is our ultimate goal as a human guide, a kind and as individuals to save our planet from climate crisis, from uh, natural disasters, from environmental degradation, etc. etc. Uh, but it is not easy to succeed this. It's only the movies that is so easy. In real life, we have some concrete, let's say, initiatives, frameworks, um, which help us to bring uh, resilience and opportunities for future generations uh, to foster awareness, to inspire action, and keep individuals and students and communities with the knowledge and the skills needed in order to build sustainable uh, communities. So you might see here the European Green Deal, the Sustainable Development Goals, the European Biodiversity Strategy, uh, the new European by Bauhaus you might have already heard. But the, all of these have a common uh, aspect, education. And education is an integral and maybe the most important uh, pillar, let's say, of all of these initiatives uh, and frameworks. So our main goal is to invest on educating students and youth and citizens on different societal and techno-economic uh, challenges. And this is the main reason um, why education is highlighted in all of these uh, initiatives we already mentioned. So in one sentence, we want to introduce um, the following initiatives and frameworks at all educational levels. And of course, nature-based uh, solutions from the early childhood education to higher uh, education and the broader society. And how will we do this and answer Priscilla's question uh, through the whole school approach and the nature-based solution living labs? So just a few words, um, Priscilla and Inselin uh, mentioned the definition uh, of nature-based solutions and of course the different societal challenges and the main categories of nature-based solutions. Um, but you have already might heard in the EU Green Deal uh, the new European Bauhaus, the biodiversity strategy and the sustainable development goals, different keywords, different initiatives, different categories, um, sustainable food consumption and from farm to fork strategy, energy efficiency, zero pollution, preserving and restoring uh, ecosystems, new European Bauhaus and buildings, school buildings, sustainable buildings, beautiful, inclusive and accessible. Um, uh, how to mitigate the impacts of climate change, quality education, sustainable cities, clean waters, and many, many, many more. All of these categories are linked to nature-based solutions and the main nature-based solutions challenges. So what we suggest and why uh, nature-based solutions are important in education? Well, creating educational experiences that make pupils and students wonder, inquire, and create curiosity and love for nature are essential for restoring the future of our planet. And here, I give the floor to my colleague Thalia um, to, to, to analyze a bit more about the whole school approach and the living labs, which are the main drive train uh, for mainstreaming MBS. Thank you, Lucas. Very happy to be with you. In the face of the challenges mentioned above, educators must be equipped with ways to promote learning for NBS and sustainable development. So how we introduce NBS and sustainability in education? 
A whole institution approach provides a framework for reorienting and redesigning education, considering the emerging global sustainability challenges. It's an integrated approach in which all educational processes that influence learning are addressed. To create a healthy habitat that invites and supports sustainability, a school will need to be both inward and outward looking at open. Adapting the concept of open schooling, schools becoming agents of community well-being by creating new partnerships with other local actors and addressing local issues relevant to them. Next slide. The Living Lab methodology puts people in charge of the innovation process. The idea is that synergies and mutual learning can be reality when students explore issues that are relevant not only to themselves but also to others, whereby community partners can offer insights but can also benefit from students' attention, research and creativity. By establishing with the local community the schools as a living lab, the students also can become more rooted in their own habitat and gain a sense of place and connectedness. For example, students, parents and staff with the support of a local NGO and the local authorities are growing their own food in a community garden or the school garden and some of the food grown is used in the school canteen. The teaching and learning must be interdisciplinary and transformative. For realizing this, learning methods and approaches that are collaborative, experiential, inquiry and problem-based, practically oriented and relevant to local contexts are more suitable. Much of the learning does not take place inside the classroom, but also in other spaces inside and outside the school building, as well as the local community, in the marketplace, at the library, the museums and through playing, reading and sports activities. Visiting also, for example, a restored wetland or participate in its restoration. The boundaries between formal, informal and non-formal learning becoming an instinct. Basic pillars of education, such as design, content and assessment for each topic, should be reflected throughout the curriculum, considering the competencies that are being developed. The development of the knowledge, skills and attitudes of learners of all age to live and act in a sustainable manner can be supported by the Green Comp, the European Sustainability Competence Framework, which have been designed to support education and training programs for lifelong learning. For example, with, a, with participating in the design and the implementation of a pocket park, students develop competencies such as promoting nature, supporting fairness, thinking critically and acting for change. Aligning what we find important and believing in what we do is critical in creating a culture of sustainability. For example, the energy and water usage the waste management, the kind of food and nutrition that is offered, the labeling of food options in the canteen menu so that students are aware of the environmental impact of their choices, the work of the staff and students with local charities to reduce food waste and redistributing food leftovers from the canteen to those in need, or the reconstruction of the schoolyard in a green space and therefore a cool island during heat waves. Last but not least, all educators, whatever their discipline or sector of education, should be considered as sustainability educators who need to support their learners in preparing for the green transition. For this reason, they need expertise and training opportunities in order to feel sufficiently equipped. Lucas, will you present now an example of schools as NBS Living Labs through the whole school approach? Yes, of course. This is just a... Uh... Uh, a conceptual, let's say, much of uh, what Thalia presented uh, with the five main uh, pillars of the whole school approach. And as a last slide, it's not the easiest one. We're going uh, to briefly present our vision for the nature-based solutions uh, living labs. Um, what, are we, what do we suggest uh, is actually to put nature-based solution al at all education levels at different grades, starting from the primary uh, schools to the upper uh, secondary schools. Uh, so we are trying to introduce uh, different NBS challenges 
from the second grade and um, hands-on activities, for instance, a nature-based solution, smart city design, hands-on activities, just constructions, uh, to the fourth grade and nature-based solutions and water management, hands-on acti activities, experiential learning, etc. to the sixth grade and some more advanced, let's say, uh, topics, uh, NBS and urban buildings, digital and outdoor activities, uh, to the fourth grade, different topics, NBS and citizen science, um, uh, or later on, uh, nature-based solutions and disaster risk management um, to the secondary school, uh, to targeted uh, nature-based solutions, green roofs, and many, many of all of these examples that uh, Thalia mentioned, to the ninth grade and to the 10th grade, at the end of this learning pathway, we are trying to test how the knowledge, skills, and potential attitudes and pro-environmental behavior of these students, starting from the second grade, has already changed. How we do this, not with simply, uh, let's say, exercises or activities or project-based uh, activities, through the NBS Living Labs. And why we select the nature-based solutions living labs? Because it's what Priscilla mentioned, co-creation. Through the living labs, students, teachers, and the school community collaborate with externals experts, professionals, policy makers, people from the local community, uh, with, uh, from universities. All of uh, these groups are trying to feel the problem. The school initiates the living lab methodology and they try to tackle and solve a localized problem and create, let's say, an NBS prototype. It might be an application, a prototype, a raising awareness campaign, and many, many more. And I stop talking. This is the main idea and the core vision of the NBS Living Labs with a continuous evaluation and impact assessment uh, processes. And thank you very much, very, very much for joining me today. Thank you very much, Lucas, and thank you, Talia, for sharing with us this experience and all that knowledge about open schooling, about living labs. Um, you've really clearly highlighted that um, NBS cannot just be taught. It needs to be experienced uh, and it needs to go outwards. It needs to go to the community. But it doesn't just go outwards in terms of only thinking about itself. Nature and the solutions that uh, we are trying all together to produce uh, allow students to explore a lot of different fields. And sometimes the question remains uh, for a lot of teachers who try to teach sustainability, um, you know, how do I fit that into the curriculum? Uh, but we have our next speaker uh, who's going to tell us a little bit more, a little bit about how nature and sustainability isn't just about trees uh, and green leaves, but there's a lot, a lot of knowledge to be shared when exploring uh, how we can live in a more sustainable world. Dominic from Train Technology, welcome. Excellent. Thank you, um, <laughs> Eddie, for that great introduction. And maybe let me just uh, start by saying that I'm extremely nervous right now because it was not very long ago that I was sitting in a classroom being inspired by teachers. But back then it was 30 of us and one teacher. So I'm a bit intimidated to be one of me and, and hundreds of you. But um, I'm so happy and honored to, to be here and to be able to um, maybe share a bit of my experience, you know, so. <clears throat> I became a mechanical engineer, uh, not because I thought it was going to be a very attractive title, but actually it was um, because I had teachers who really inspired me to follow this technical field. As I um, went on to do my engineering studies, um, I became specialized in thermodynamics, became very passionate about um, renewable energy. And I always imagined one day, <laughs> I'm going to work for a big renewable energy company like wind energy or solar. And then I ended up at Train Technologies, which, as Eddie explained at the beginning, is a big um, heat global heating and cooling company. So I thought, boy, what a detour, right? <laughs> if you think about the heating and cooling industry, I don't know if you're aware of this, but um, companies like Train Technologies, right, and, and the whole industry, 
we are responsible for one quarter of global carbon emissions, right? 25%. About 15% of that is just coming. It's carbon that we emit just by cooling and heating buildings. 10% of that is coming from distribution of food and food waste. So, you know, it for me, it was kind of a journey to flip that over on its head and not think about the heating and cooling industry as a culprit, but to actually see the opportunity to do better, right? I, you know, I've been listening to the other speakers and, I, and I've been really inspired by hearing how we can inspire students inside of the classroom, how we can get students to be more active in their community and how we do, how do we bring nature-based solutions into that? Ultimately though, we are hoping that one day these students will graduate, right? Hopefully from university and they'll go on more likely to work for companies. So how do they bring in that spirit and their learning into the companies that they are going to be working for? And it could possibly be um, a company like Train Technologies. Now, Eddie and the team asked me to explain a little bit more from a corporate perspective, what does sustainability mean? Because it gets thrown out a lot, right? But for a company like Train Technologies, what does that effectively mean? So, um, First of all, to be a sustainability driven company, it's not just about saying you're going to do it or say why it's important to you. The first step is really to make commitments and say, right, th this is what we ambition to, to do. A lot of companies, including ours, think about their sustainability commitments in terms of, well, we're going to develop new products which are more efficient, which are inspired by nature, which don't use toxic materials. And that is all great but it's one component of sustainability, right? There's another component of sustainability, which is thinking about what does it take for us as an industry to build those products and to commercialize those projects? So Train Technologies is looking a lot at its own carbon footprint and thinking about how we can lead by example. We have the ambition to become a carbon neutral company by 2030, and I'm very happy to announce that we are on par to <clears throat> reach that that target. Um, we also have another pillar, which is really more around the positive social impact that we have. So that's another component of sustainability, which is really important to us. And it's one of the reasons why we have this partnership with the EUN and STEM Alliance is because we want to bring this to the students all over the world to understand why an industry like ours needs to improve, the opportunity that we have to improve and the fundamental role that they are gonna play into it. Now, this is a big slide and I'm sorry for that, it's all over the place, but there's one particular um, sustainability commitment that I'm actually very proud about and it's gathered a lot of energy in our company and it's what we like to call the Gigaton Challenge. So <clears throat> the Gigaton Challenge is no more, no less than train technology saying, by 2030, we want to remove or at least avoid one gigaton. I think it's one billion. I better look at my slides because it's too small here and I always get confused, believe it or not. <laughs> we want to reduce our customer carbon footprint by one gigaton. So that is equivalent to one billion metric tons of CO2 equivalent. If that still does not mean anything to you, that is okay. It also meant nothing to me. So another metric that I like to use is if you think about the carbon emissions of France, Italy, and Germany combined, that's one gigaton. So just imagine France, Italy, and Germany suddenly saying we're not going to emit any more carbon emissions. That's the equivalent of how much we're looking to remove um, by 2030. It's ambitious, right? So you can't put a goal out there without really having concrete ways of getting there, especially for an industry, a heating and cooling industry like ours, where like I said, we're responsible for 25% of carbon emissions. So that takes me to our decarbonization strategy. What does decarbonization ultimately mean? It's a very fancy word for strategy that we put in place to remove carbon fossil fuels and carbon emissions. So there are several strategies that we've we've put in place and not just us, but you know, a lot of the industry is starting to follow us as well. You can think about making the heating and cooling industry more sustainable by looking at reducing direct emissions. So today, more than 40% of heating in Europe is done by boilers. 
probably most of you have a boiler in your home or in your office, even if you've never seen it in your life. What a boiler does is ultimately you're taking a fossil fuel such as gas or fuel and you're burning it to generate heat. Today we have, thanks to technology and innovation, a much more efficient way to do that and a way which, by the way, is actually inspired by nature and I'll explain why in my next slide. But one of our big focuses is here is really to try and decarbonize by electrifying things like heating. So how do we replace a boiler with a heat pump that actually produces heating using nature? And I'll explain how in, in, our next, in my next um, slide. All of our heating cooling systems also use refrigerants and refrigerants are known to have a very high global potential warming, which means they have a very bad Im impact on the environment. So there's two ways we go about this. Um, if any of your students are interested in chemistry, this is the way to go. So one way to look at it is, okay, how do we avoid refrigerants from leaking into the atmosphere? That's what effectively creates a negative impact. But more importantly, how we can how can we transition heating and cooling systems to look at refrigerants that have a lower GWP? And this is where a lot of the innovation is, is, is happening. You also hear about natural refrigerants. I don't talk too much about that because then I would need three hours. So I'm just going to keep it at there's a lot of solutions, but we need creative minds <laughs> and that starts at school to really help us think through how this transition is going to happen. So that's the very direct, right? It's very like this is the product and how do we change this for that? But then there's also a way that we can reduce um, our carbon footprint by thinking about indirect emissions. And I love some of the things that Lucas talked about before. I think it was in grade six when you talked about NBS and urban buildings. We're also shifting our mindset not to think about buildings as bricks and concrete, but actually think about buildings as living things. And in my next and final slide, I'll explain why and how that, that happens. But ultimately, it's, it's shifting our mindset to looking at how can we become, how can buildings be more connected with the city? For example, a lot of cities in Europe are really increasing electrification of vehicles, right? Everyone moving from fossil fuel cars to electric vehicles. As a result, we're seeing a lot of charging stations come by. Everybody's concerned about the grid. Did you know that buildings can actually be a source of energy? So what if we connected building networks with the charging networks and used buildings to be able to charge cars, right? It's that kind of sort of big thinking that we need for um, to create a more sustainable to tomorrow. So this is a really high level because Eddie did tell me I had less than 10 minutes just to talk to you about some of the practical ways that we are decarbonizing and trying to reach our sustainability commitments. All of this requires creative students, which all of the speakers talked about how bringing NBS into classrooms helps to spark creativity and collaboration. So this is the kind of skills that we need in the industry today to help build the, the sustainable future of, of tomorrow. Now, to conclude, this is my favorite part. Um, as a student, nobody ever told me what a heat pump or a chiller was, right? If we ever talked about nature-based solutions, we would typically go talk about trees <laughs> and biology at most. But um, it's actually really interesting to see and discover that a lot of the innovations that we're seeing, oops, I forgot to switch my slide, didn't I? All right, now you see the inspired by nature, right? This is what happens when you manage too many screens. I really need to get better at that. <laughs> yeah. So there's a lot of new emerging technologies and innovations coming up in our industry, which are actually taking inspiration from nature. I promised you that I'd explain, for example, how replace, replacing a boiler with a heat pump is an example of that. So um, a lot of people don't really know this, but there is energy all around us. And essentially, the way that an HVAC system, HVAC is heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, the way that an HVAC system works, it's all about moving energy from a place that has a lot of heat to a place which has little heat. We don't create heat, we simply move it. That's the first thing that took me five years of college to understand, so hopefully it will take you a lot less. When we think about heat pump systems as an example, these are interchangeable systems, which during the, the summer, you have a need for cooling inside a building. So effectively what this system is going to do, it's going to remove 
heat from inside a building and reject it. In winter, though, this is when it becomes more interesting. Even though you think it's cold in winter, in fact, due to uh, things like humidity, so we don't think about energy as temperature, we think about it as enthalpy, there is actually energy in the air. And the heat pump is capable of actually extracting that heat, which is in your outdoor air, and using it to heat up the inside of your building. Now, thank God our marketing team is very talented and created a very nice video, which I, I think Julia has already posted in the chat called uh, Heating Naturally, which explains a little bit better how this phenomenon works. But really, it's we design systems to help capture heat, which is already in the nature around us. We've also designed systems which look at capturing heat, which is in rivers, right, or even under the ground. So really, it's looking at where is energy around us in the nature and how can we capture that and use that in a sustainable way. Um, there's also another phenomenon, which is, you know, remember I talked about the example of electrical grids, right? And sometimes we need to have a lot for a lot of energy and electricity, for example, during the day. Um, in countries like Portugal, where I'm from, we actually have a really big issue, which is the fact that we have overproduction of electricity at night because our windmills are running, producing a lot of energy, but no one's using it because everybody's asleep. So, our engineers have come up with a system where you can actually take that surplus of electricity to generate cooling, but no one's using that cooling during the day, right? For classrooms are closed, supermarkets are closed. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna capture that. We're gonna build ice. Ice is basically a natural thing, the same thing you would put in your drink to cool it up. We're gonna stall, store all of that energy into ice. And then the next day when we need it, schools open up, buildings open up, we release that heat from the ice and cool the building as well. So it's really, how do we take advantage of surplus of electricity reduction? Finally, last one, my favorite one, passive cooling. So this is actually a, a new solution which we developed uh, last year. And I was so excited. I thought our engineers had like uncovered the best thing ever when I did a little bit of research and I realized that this technology actually comes from the Persian ancient civilization. So. The, the whole idea is, remember what I said at the beginning, it's all about heat transfer, right? Heat, <laughs> energy always wants to go from a source where there's little energy to a sink where there's too much, or actually it's the contrary. We can think about the sky <laughs> as a really, really, really cold place. There's not a lot of energy. There's a reason why astronauts wear all the suits and all the thermal insulation. It's really cold up there. So what the ancient civilizations in Persia actually discovered was that if they filled up a pool with water at sunset, when they went there the next morning, they would have chunks of ice. That's nature. That's it. They put water in a pool, cool it overnight, boom, they have ice. This is really a phenomenon that we call radiative cooling. So whenever a surface has been exposed to a lot of heat, it has this tendency to just start radiating heat back to the sky. We've taken this principle, this natural principle, and applied it into a technology that we call passive cooling. And we've used it on buildings. We've even used it on cooling carts for, for street vendors. So that's just three examples really quick because I've already exceeded my time and Eddie is like looking at me saying, Dominique, I said 10 minutes. Um, I could talk about this a lot more for hours. My key message is it's great. All of these projects that I've heard about, about inspiring students, getting their hands dirty, working on community projects. Let's also think about how we can make them more curious about the world <laughs> that is around us, how these technologies actually work and how we can make them better and how we can be inspired by nature to provide heating and cooling in a more sustainable way. All right. Thank you very much, Dominique. <laughs> I thought we had lost you for a second here. Um, Thank you all of you uh, for being with us tonight and for sharing uh, all these different angles on sustainability in education, on nature-based solutions, uh, on solutions inspired by nature as well, slightly different uh, areas, uh, but nevertheless, very, very interesting. Um, and also for sharing that 
nature and protecting nature and sustainability goes beyond. Uh, goes beyond, of course, looking at nature-based solutions. It's everywhere, and there's a lot of opportunities to explore STEM as well. Uh, unfortunately, we're a little bit tight for time um, for questions, but I've seen a lot of great interactions in the chat, and I've seen that our speakers have happily answered uh, to some of your questions already. Um, one question that has stood out uh, and that gets asked frequently, how do you manage to introduce nature-based solutions and sustainability when the compulsory curriculum uh, implies or requ requires to follow specific competences. Is there anyone who cares to have a try from our speakers at answering that question, that very important question? No? Oh, come on. I, I don't know. I can make a start. You can make a start. I don't think we'll have time for a full-blown yeah. thesis anyway. <laughs> Just an effort that uh, you have to think always that uh, the environmental or sustainability education programs uh, and courses uh, at schools um, are always changing. Um, so different aspects of uh, sustainability, like nature-based solutions, might be introduced into the school curricula with a lot of different ways, from science courses to art courses to social sciences and many, many more. more. So I think it's a good option to start identifying different competence uh, areas uh, linked to sustainability competencies in order to introduce uh, such innovative, uh, let's say, topics like nature-based solutions. Uh, solutions. Not, it's not always that easy, uh, but I think we can find different ways uh, to do this. Thank you, Lucas. Uh, I think that's a very good answer. It's a very good first try. Um, competences, skills are wide and varied, and it is a teacher's uh, responsibility to help develop those in their students. And I think um, anyone uh, like Iseline, for example, who has looked at the research on the topic, uh, could also support the idea that while the curriculum can be a little bit rigid at times. Uh, there's a lot of room for flexibility. Uh, and that's what the NBS um, EduWorld project is looking at, collecting all information from lots of different place, places, connecting with communities, connecting different topics together, and bringing it to the students and to the learners of all ages. Uh, that's also what the NBS um, MOOC is going to help with. Uh, now, I'd like to share a couple of reminder uh, before we part for the evening. Um, first, the NBS EduWorld and the NBS MOOC are offering the competition for teachers. So that's an opportunity for teachers uh, who have participated in the MOOC or haven't uh, to create their own learning scenario and to offer innovative uh, methodologies, innovative ideas to bring nature-based solutions into their lessons, whether those lessons take place inside the classroom or outside the classroom, and whether they just involve planting trees or actually look at STEM skills uh, across the board. So make sure to check it out. And of course, we strongly encourage everyone to participate in the competition. And of course, this webinar was public, so we can expect that a lot of you are already enrolled in the MOOC, uh, but I'd like to bring to the attention to those who may not be enrolled in the MOOC yet, that it is still open and you can still register to learn lots of very, very interesting things about nature-based solutions, how to implement them in the classroom. Uh, a lot of the topics that were covered in the webinar tonight uh, are explored in more detail uh, in the MOOC. Uh, so you have some time still to register and you will get the opportunity to work on a learning scenario with your peers. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of our speakers. Uh, we were so very pleased to have you with us and so very pleased to have you share lots of different perspectives uh, on nature-based solutions and sustainability in the classroom uh, and outside the classroom, I must say, and in the community. Thank you so much, all of you, for being with us tonight. Thank you to all um, our attendees 
for the event as well. It's been a great pleasure hosting uh, this event for you. And one final reminder, please, if you haven't done it already, sign the signatures list. You will not receive a certificate otherwise. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, it's been a great pleasure. We wish you a lovely evening or lovely whatever is the time of the day uh, where you are. Uh, and we wish to see you soon at the next event or in the MOOC or in the competition. Bye everyone.